Some of you may know me from Twitter, which is why I put the picture I have on Twitter up there. I'm at Mackenzie Wi-Fi on Twitter. So um, Now, I just want to talk about the situation we're in at the moment. Here's you guys. Coming soon is beer. <laughs> <laughs> and here's me. And I'm between you and beer. And I'm aware of that situation. So I thought we'd keep it a quick two hours, and no. Um, the, the other thing I'm aware of is, as there's been some great presentations today, and as it's gone on, the, the first talk maybe took 25% of my presentation. Um, the, the next talk took maybe the, another 25%. And I thought, that's OK. I just sort of 50% of new stuff to tell you. And then Keith's come up and just taken the rest of it. So thanks for that, Keith. Um, so I, I'm also aware that a lot of what I was going to talk about has been covered. So what I thought we'd do is try and keep this quite interactive. You may have some questions which have come up from other people's talks about some of the things we can discuss. Um, do tell me. Um, it, it might be I might break into another slideshow and just do something completely different. It, we'll see how it goes. Um, but I'll, I'll try and give you maybe some slightly different um, ways of talking about some of the things we've also talked about as well. Um, and if we get done quick soon, we get beer quicker. How about that? Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the things that I was going to talk about. We might miss some slides out because it's already been said. Um, but Let's just talk about hoping that Wi-Fi doesn't work. How many times do we hear it that Wi-Fi doesn't work? It's slow, it's rubbish, it doesn't work in here, the signal keeps dropping out, I keep getting disconnected. And to be honest with you, Wi-Fi's got a bit of a bad reputation. I think if you generally ask people, they'll say Wi-Fi, it, it, it doesn't work very well, it, it's really slow, um, the Wi-Fi is awful. Um, and and I, I, I just think Wi-Fi generally gets a, a really bad reputation. Now, I spend a lot of my time, I spend about 50% of my time t teaching. The other 50% of my time is spent either doing Wi-Fi design or troubleshooting and fault finding networks with problems. And I go into an awful, awful lot of networks where the Wi-Fi doesn't work. Okay, for whatever reason, one way or another. And there's, I, I want to talk to you about the number one reason Wi-Fi doesn't work. Uh, and, and it's possibly this, the, the reason, number one, probably 90% of the wireless networks I go in and fix uh, comes down to the same problem. And that is, it doesn't work because it's a bad design. Now, it's easy to say that, isn't it? It doesn't work because it's been a bad design. But somewhere in the design process, mistakes have been made, which has led to this wireless network not working properly. Um, now, I've got up a, a, a sort of what I count as the sort of four steps or the four processes that you need to go through when designing a wireless network. When, when, when I'm talking about design, I'm talking about design to the implementation. Um, we, we've got, starting off with define, You've got to define what the wireless network is here to achieve, what the requirements of the wireless network is, what the customer wants the wireless network to, to achieve, and, and it needs to be properly defined. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that next. Then we actually go to the design. This is coming up with uh, where I'm going to put my APs and, and what sort of power levels and channels. There are lots being talked about design today. Um, then we go to deploy and then validate. Um, validation is a massively key step. In fact, all of these are key and important. One of the reasons that wireless networks don't work often is because one or more of these steps hasn't been taken. And the two that very often get missed out is the define and validate. Some people go straight to the deploy because, you know, I put, I want to deploy Wi-Fi in my house. What do I do? I put an AP in my house and it works, doesn't it? That's the thing about Wi-Fi. It does work. Even in Wi-Fi, we say it doesn't work. It normally does work. It just works badly. So if I can put an AP in my house, why can't I put one in, my, in an organization, in an enterprise, in a college, in a university, in a manufacturing facility? The problem is Wi-Fi doesn't scale very well. If you've got one AP and three users, it works really well. The minute you try and scale it up, 
it doesn't work as well. So we need to make sure we go through all these steps and, and we go through them in um, a logical manner as well. So I would say, though, out of those, the one I come across the most is that no one's defined the wireless network. It's that first step that normally gets missed out and it is the most important. And if it had only been defined properly, they could have then designed it properly. They could have then deployed it properly because they had a proper design and then they would need to validate it. Sometimes it's a validation that's missing. So let's look at a, a few issues um, that we get with these things. Um, there's already been quite a bit mentioned about which requirements capture, so I won't talk a, a huge amount about it. Um, but during the requirements capture, you need to get all the information you need to know to design your wireless network properly. If I'm going to produce a heat map and I'm going to use that how and I'm going to have some building plans which I'm going to get hurled up and I'm going to put create what it's going to look like, I need to know what the wall attenuation measurements are. <coughs> and if you rely on the ones that are built into the tools, then they're not the real ones, are they? So if people talk about designing this room, well, what's that wall made of? What, how much does the signal attenuate? If you don't go and measure that on site, you're not going to know. And with any design, if you put garbage in, you'll get garbage out. If you put real world values in, you'll get real world response out. So you've got to go and measure and visit a site. I don't believe you can design a wireless network and have never been to the site. If, you're, if it exists, obviously if it's a new build, you can maybe come up with a prediction based upon the materials, but then you go and validate it and tune it later. Sometimes we have to do that, but you have to visit the site and take some real measurements. Otherwise, you're just going to come up with a nice pretty picture. I'll talk a bit more about that later on. Um, also, what's the wireless network being used for? Um, if it's being used for, 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 we've already talked about, this is already talked about, so I'm not going to mention it much, but voice, location, just for data, is it being used for warehousing applications, barcode scanners, all of those purposes are going to come up with a completely different design. So if I don't know and I don't ask the question, how can I design a wireless network? If I, where do I put my APs for a location-based solution is going to be very different to where I put it for a voice deployment. Generally, with Wi-Fi, we talk about putting Omni APs in the center of rooms, but for location, you want them on the outside of rooms so you can triangulate and locate devices with inside a room. So it's a completely different design, so unless I know up front what, if that's a requirement, I can design it. Also, area. How many people, when you go, where do you want Wi-Fi? What's the answer? Everywhere, isn't it? I want Wi-Fi everywhere. But do you want Wi-Fi everywhere? Do you want it in the toilets? Do you want it in the plant rooms? Do you want it in the elevator? <laughs> Sometimes you do. And all of those areas can be done. Do you want it around the perimeter of your building? Sometimes your customers won't know the answer to that. So you've got to... But part of... If you know the purpose, you can actually have, help them work out the areas. So if, you know... The purpose is in a hospital and it's for, we've got location badges and we've got to locate nurses and they've got a panic button on. And let's say that uh, uh, this becomes um, especially important in sort of um, hospitals dealing with mental illnesses where they can potentially get attacked. Now when I say where do you want Wi-Fi coverage, they really mean everywhere. Because if that nurse is outside having a cigarette and then they get attacked and they press it and it's, sorry, sorry we didn't have Wi-Fi coverage there. We couldn't send anyone to help you. It's, it, it becomes critical. It's got to work. So we, as we, we, we need to understand the, the, the purpose, and therefore we can help determine the areas. Um, we need to know capacity. Um, I might talk a little bit about design for capacity towards the end of this talk, so um, I'll leave that. We need to know the clients. I'll talk a little bit more about that as well, and what applications. So we need to have a good understanding of these requirements. If you don't do your requirements capture, you can design Wi-Fi. <coughs> Never, ever miss out this step. It is the number one most important step, I think, of doing a Wi-Fi design. Because if you get this wrong, your design will be wrong, you'll implement the wrong solution, the experience will be poor. Keep somebody said this, but green does not mean good. Pictures. 
That's a nice picture of a square with lots of green on it. Um, and first of all, I, if anyone can produce a green picture and a nice pretty picture and give it to someone and say, look, I've done a Wi-Fi design for you. Um, I can do that when, without visiting the site, without getting any requirements. Does it mean it's going to be any good? No. It doesn't mean it's going to be any good at all. And also, it depends if, if you're in a, some of these tools. Where have I got a slider? Have I set it at minus 65, minus 67? And what should you design to? Just out of interest. So, um, have you seen specifications? Customers maybe even give you them, or if you design it, what do you design to? You design to maybe minus 65, minus 67? Would that sound right? People do that? No, everybody's really cool, doesn't want to speak after keeps talking now. <laughs> so so let, let's say someone says, you, you've done some sort of requirements and i you said, I want mine at 67 everywhere. I'm, I'm literally working with a customer at the moment and they gave to the people who designed that network mine at 67. And, and I've gone in and then they've, they've, they've got issues with the network and I've gone in to say, and one thing they keep saying is, have they designed it as to what we specified, mine at 67? What does that mean? What does minus 67 mean? If you first specification, what's it mean? Signal at 67 anywhere on the premises. Okay, measured by what device? Well, measured by, yeah, by the USB dongle. By a USB dongle. So, how many USB dongles do you have in your? The one for the, the, one for the survey. So, this is, this is what I'm. So, we often go, oh, we want minus 67 everywhere, but. But unless we can answer the question by what device, um, uh, it doesn't mean anything, does it? And, and even if we do answer it by what device, let's say we say, I want it as measured by an iPhone. Do I mean my iPhone or do I mean Keith's iPhone? Is it, is it, is it that big a difference? What, between mine and Keith's iPhone? Well, let's just let's look at some different devices. I'm really glad you asked that question. <laughs> Um, so, I did, this is some tests and I did, um, and I had a, my, my old Lenovo X20 laptop, when I did its testing, I had a Galaxy Nerve 3 and an iPhone 6 Plus. And I had them set, and there was an AP, other side room, completely open place, clear space between them, set in, and I had a mad out area on the table, which I put it in. And we, I just measured signal strength, and I, I tried to get an average. So, you know, 2.4 gigahertz signal strength, it's Lenovo laptop, it was picking up the AP at NAIC 49 and NAIC 52. So I was reasonably close to the AP. It was, it was maybe about six, seven meters away from me. The Galaxy Nerd, however, received minus 66 in the 2.4 gig, that's 17 dB different. <laughs> and in the 5 gig, though, it was only 4 dB different. Whereas the iPhone, was an egg 58, which was a 9 dB driven from the laptop, and but on the 5 gig, it was minus 69, that's 17 dB driven. That was variations in devices in the same, in the same location measuring the same AP. So what device you have matters. It matters a lot. Um, and it's not just, it's not just advice, even when you take a device, a device is going to vary in how it sees a signal strength. So th this is now just looking at the iPhone. And actually, this is what it saw set in that one location, not moving over time. The maximum it had, the signal, was neg 45. The minimum was neg 63. It's quite a variation, isn't it? And then when you said, and here comes my next question, OK, we want mine at 67 everywhere. Do you mean you want it with me? facing the AP, with my back to the AP, with my device this way up, this way up, like this. How, 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 in, in what orientation? Standing on one leg? Yeah, but you're just being difficult now. Am I? <laughs> so I, 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 <laughs> so I, I, I am just being difficult, but here, this is what the same test did, same period of time of me moving the device, okay? I was just doing this. On the same spot, though, in this location, while I click 
in my ECHAL survey, but just moving it. Now that's what the signal strength variation looked like. I had to move from this place in this building. I just sometimes had my phone that way, sometimes this way. I was facing the AP with my back to it. And now I've got variations between neg 38 and neg 75. Understanding our devices and how they see signal strength actually is really important for design. Some devices receive signals better, some don't, and there's always a, a, a range. So, and so therefore knowing how they're going to be used. Lots and lots of people talk about barcode scanners as being really problematic devices. They, they are problematic devices. Um, they're problematic, though, for two reasons. Normally, they, they, people buy them and buy them for an awful long time, so they have old chipsets in. They normally have really poor receiver sensitivity, so they're one of the lower. They receive the devices at a worse signal, normally around 10 to 12 dB less than maybe a laptop or a survey adapter. But they're also moving all the time, and someone will scan a barcode down here on a shelf, and then they'll turn around up here, and they'll hold it at that angle, this angle. So you've got this whole variation in signal strength. So if we design a network, but we need to understand that, and we need to understand how much signal we need to be giving out for that, that to work in all permutations and orientations, given the way it works. This is just plotting both the static and non-static on top of one another, so you can see it. So to me, green just means, hey, I've painted lots of green everywhere. Um, what I'm interested in is, can my client work in that location? Okay. So, from a client's point of view, if I stand here and I get, net, if I'm a user of the Wi-Fi, and I'm stood here and I'm getting neg 67, or I'm getting neg 68 or neg 69, do I care? As a user, do I care? What am I bothered about? Can I connect? Can my applications work? And, and that's what becomes really important to a user. So we need to think about, that's why we need to do all that research beforehand. That's why the information requirements are so important. So we know what clients, we know what applications, we have an understanding what those applications need to perform. And now when we're designing networks, we can design it to make sure that in that location, actually our applications work. Um, let's talk about a couple of other things. Let's talk about place and access points in the right location. Oh, three, of these, three of these pictures are actually pictures I've taken in the work I've done, going around and assessing what people's networks. No, not, not me and Saul, but... <laughs> so, so, so in, when I've gone into troubleshoot networks, three of these pictures, one of them is actually from a bedfire.com website, which is why I've put that, which is what, because... Um, and I'll tell you the story behind it, but I just love it. But l let's just look at them. This is what people do. They place APs because why do, why do you end up getting APs placed behind pipes like that? Anybody know? Is it just really dumb installers? Or could it be the designers? Because if you've not been on site to look at the building and taken photographs, and then you put a dot on a map, and you've moved it around, and you've modelled the coverage, and yet just here is the right place for coverage. And then the, and just there, there happens to be two pipes running across the ceiling. That's where they're going to install it. So the perfect RF location for an AP isn't necessarily the placement that you want to put the AP because of the environment around it. Um, that's exactly what happened with that one. The installer just said, oh, I'll just put it where the dot was on the map. It got placed behind two metal pipes. Um, this one's brilliant. Um, how, this is actually pointing at a concrete floor, mounted in a void on a concrete floor, pointing straight down. Um, the, the reason being was, um, they wanted to cover the floor below, and they didn't really want the AP to be seen. And it was OK, because the AP couldn't be seen or any signal strength from the AP. So they <laughs> achieved that quite well. Um, it, was, uh, I, I, we, we, it took me a long time to hunt it down, because they were like, uh, we were actually serving to redesign, and they had really bad coverage in its um, location. And I, and, but we couldn't find half the APs that were on the map. 
And when I mean I said they must be turned off, and then I, and then we went up into the void, and it lit up like a, and a um, where they didn't need any wireless coverage. It had really good Wi-Fi coverage <laughs> up in the void. So, and there was there was a four or five of these APs mounted exactly like this. Um, this is my pet hate. The next one, but I've put it there because it's it's even worse. Is APs above ceilings? Um, in the ceiling tile. This one, first of all, be, be, before I tell you why I really hate them, but this one was brilliant because it was cable mounted to a pipe, and then the, 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 where the Ethernet socket was, they obviously had a short cable and couldn't be bothered to buy a longer cable. So they just made it stretch by pulling the AP. So it was on an angle pointing towards the, pointing up, sort of up towards this wall because the Ethernet cable was forcing it that way. Um, and do you, you get people, don't you? I get it all the time. People going, well, we don't want the APs on display, so we're just going to put them above the ceiling tiles. Do you know what I say? Architects come to you and just say that it doesn't look they, nice. They can be on display. So, so what I say is, do you want, do you want good Wi-Fi? I can place your APs above the ceiling, but it will be per quality. If you want your Wi-Fi to suck, and you want to get complaints, don't put your Wi-Fi. It will, will it work? Yeah, it work. It will just work badly. So you can put them up above your ceiling tiles, but it will work badly. Unless you're going to start moving all your workers up to, uh, into the drop ceiling, which is where you'll have good signal, um, it will work really badly. Do you put sprinklers up above drop ceilings? Or smoke detectors up above drop ceilings? Why, why do you not do it? Why do you not put a smoke detector above the drop ceiling? It works well. Because it won't work well. So why put an access point above a drop ceiling when it won't work well? But people insist on doing it. And I would say, do not do it. And, and, and be strong with your customers. Say, it will not work well if you want me to do that. Because until we tell people that, they'll carry on doing it. Um, and it really, really doesn't work well. And what's even worse is if you then have sort of automatic tap power and channel settings, all the APs up in the ceiling can hear each other really strong. So they tune the power right down. So it's not just now got to penetrate the ceiling tile, it's also having its power reduced. Don't put them. Um, this last one is just a favorite one of mine, was um, a, a tinfoil wrapped AP. Um, this, was in a, this was in a hospital. It's not one of my pictures, but um, this was... Um, uh, apparently, it was one of the um, doctors decided that the Wi-Fi was obviously going to damage their health. Um, so they kept wrapping it in tinfoil, and every time they took the tinfoil off next day, the tinfoil was back on the AP. Um, it's very fun. Um, okay. Let's talk about uh, a couple of things. Um, this has already been mentioned, so I won't spend too much, but... Most access points today have omni down tilt antennas. They've got integrated down tilt omni antennas. They're designed to be ceiling mounted. So if you form an omni antenna, you get a like a donut shape. That's how omnis work, 360 degrees. If, if I mount it on a wall, it's going to be going that way. Now they're down tilt, so they do focus them that donut down. You put it on a wall. My donut's now going this way around. I've got half my signal going up to the ceiling, half of it coming down here, and let's go into the room. Because it's down tilt, I'll get more into the room. How much will I get behind me? Very little. You'll get some, but if it's been designed with a dot on a map, and you've got as if it's been, and you've got, and you're going to be covering four, two rooms behind you, two rooms in front of you, and it gets mounted on a wall, you're not going to get your two rooms behind you. So, you know, look, if you have to mount on a wall, there's all sorts of ways of mounting APs on walls and make them that, you know, on the side. Um, again, I'm not going to talk much. Keith's obviously said this. Never put your APs in corridors. Stop doing it. It sounds like a really good idea. It's a really bad idea. Where, unless you're trying to cover the corridor because people want to work in the corridor... If we look, at this was, um, again, a survey did. It had three APs on the corridor. These were the rooms where the workers were, where its grey is, and the grey is at the bottom. 
they were not getting coverage, but you got a really great signal in the corridor. <laughs> Put your access points where your users are, as close as possible. It's a number one, it's a really simple rule, but always put your APs where your users are. So your users are not in the drop ceiling, don't put your APs there. Your users are not out in corridors, don't put your APs out there. I want to just quickly talk about our, our um, radio resource management. Every vendor gives it a different name, um, but this is the automatic settings that um, a lot of our vendor APs do to ultimately choose power and channel settings. Um, and a lot of people just have it turned on by default. So this is um, a, a survey I did of a manufacturing site. We were going in there to do a redesign for them, but we surveyed their existing network. And they had coverage holes, and this was a 5 gig coverage. And you can see a few coverage holes. Um, it, it wasn't great, but it wasn't that bad. So I'll show you what the 2.4 gig coverage looked like. It looked like that. Same number of APs, all had 2.4 and 5 gig turned on. That is what the coverage from 2.4 looked like. This was a manufacturing site. It had fairly high ceilings. All the APs were installed on the ceiling. What does the RMM do? The APs go, how do I head the environment? What do I need to do? And they try and reduce what is a good thing to try and do is co-channel interference. So when I can hear another AP on the same channel power, I'm going to try and reduce my power. But because they're all high on the ceiling, they can all hear each other much stronger than the clients can hear them. So they all reduce their power down, and we get, but where the clients are on the floor, you've got no signal left. And a lot of their coverage holes were literally due to their APs just being on too small a power, because you've let an algorithm try and determine what the best power is for you. Many, many of the problems I fix are due to our MM. Many, many of them due to people leaving these automatic channel things served on. Um, and the, let me just give you another example. This was literally one from um, a really recent one of a, a supermarket store. Here, they've decided that the best channels for these three APs are all 11, channel 11. These are GSN APs. It decided, I'll just say up top here, all these three APs at fault, the best is channel 11. Now, how it makes that decision, each AP makes it in itself. So each AP has determined the bat, my bat's channel is 11. You could say that's not very good, which it isn't. However, because then when they then set the power levels, they also go, well, um, we, we want to minimise curve channel interference. I can hear my, some neighbours on channel 11, so I'm going to reduce my power to try and fix that. So now what you've got is not only three APs on channel 11, they've all reduced the power and left big coverage holes. And when you're working with a scanner, which again needs really good signal, it just keeps dropping out. If you are going to use any sort of automatic channel and power settings, you need to tune it. Leaving it on the default so it can go to any power level, any channel, it will not work very well for you. I personally do static channel plans and power settings every single design because then I can control, I know what channel my APs are using, I know what power level setting they are. But even if you want to use the automatic ones, you need to still, it doesn't save you time in your design. It's not a shortcut for designing good Wi-Fi. If you're going to do it, you still need to, when you design, when you design a network in, let's say you use Akahal, and you design your network, what do you do to each AP? You give it a channel and you give it a power level. And you get that nice heat map, we get our green heat map, okay? Given that green heat map, given... Now, what have you done? You've designed for a particular power level, haven't you? If you're then going to let your APs go to a lower power level, will your design still work? No. It won't, will it? So don't let it. <coughs> now, there is an argument to say, if you want to do automatic, set that as your minimum power level and allow it to maybe increase in power so you've got some dynamic range. But when I say increase, only I mean like one or two, one power level, if you like, using Cisco, I would say. But make sure you can go below your minimum. 
Be, uh, so you still have to work out a power and work and are now statically assigned channels as well. Uh, unless you like having a JSON APIs on. Or you want to, you know, design a network for me to come and fix. I always need to be capped in work, so <laughs> then carry on. Um, but just be really careful. The Wi-Fi is rubbish in here. Okay? Here's um, a frustrated user. Here is the AP. Everybody see the AP? Everybody see the user. How many people have seen situations like this? I come across it all the time. They, are not have, they, do, they do not have a signal problem. Even if you've got automatic power settings and it's reduced the power on the AP, they do not have a power problem. They are getting a good signal. But they still go to Wi-Fi. It's rubbish in here. I did a survey not that long ago, and we were walking around with a, a, um, someone from the organisation. They were being escorted round because it was a manufacturing facility. And uh, we kept, nearly every room we went in, they kept going, Hi, Wi-Fi is rubbish in here, isn't it? And oh, yeah, yeah, Wi-Fi is rubbish. And uh, literally everywhere I was going, I was thinking, I know they may have some coverage holes and we're going to redesign our network, but everywhere, Wi-Fi is rubbish. And we went in one room, literally like this, one, it was a little office, um, and they went, Wi-Fi rubbish, yeah, it never works, we can never connect, always dropping out. And I looked at this woman, and she, there was the AP above her head. I said, yeah, it just never works. I said, can I, can I have a look? What do you mean? Do, do, you know your little signal bars, are they ever like going down? And she was like, oh, no, no, they're always full, but Wi-Fi keeps dropping out. Um, I also noticed, when, when I looked at my machine, it looked very like this. Have people seen it? So full signal strength, but um, it says IP connectivity, no access. Or you get the little explanation mark saying limited connectivity. The Wi-Fi is really poor. But actually, you know, what does that mean? It's not got a DHCP address. So when we come to look at Wi-Fi, it's not just all about delivering signal strength to a user. It's also about delivering network connectivity to a user. And you've got to see it as a full system. Um, and you need to make sure. One thing I was very keen on then in my report was I said, I can design you a new Wi-Fi. It can be, it'll be really, really good. But you will still have wireless network problems once you install it until you sort out your DHCP problems. And I was very, and you know, they need sorting out. Um, again, the other thing that Keith's mentioned um, already, but I, I was gonna mention was, how big is your pipe? If you're providing internet access, how, how big's the pipe behind it? Because you can provide a really, really fast wireless network where everyone's connected at, you know, 300 megabits per second, but if you give them a really tiny pipe to the internet, they're going to have really bad Wi-Fi performance. In fact, did you know a really big pipe out to the internet can actually mask a, a bad Wi-Fi network and make it perform well? You need to have your back end good before you can deliver Wi-Fi. If the back end is awful, the Wi-Fi experience will be rubbish. <coughs> Channels then. It's great having N and AC. It gave us bigger channels, didn't it? What do bigger channels mean? More throughput. And there's a lot of discussion often when design wireless is, what channel width do you design for? Do you design for having, you know, 160 mag channels, um, <coughs> 80 mag channels, 40 mag channels, or 20 mag channels? The idea behind 40 mag channels is we can put two 20 mag channels together. We've got a bigger road now, we've got like using two lanes on our motor instead of one, we can push more data. And we can push twice as much data. If we move to an 80 meg channel, that's like four 20 meg channels, and now I can get even more data. The problem is, is spectrum, isn't it? We only have so much of it. We only have so much airtime, and we only have so much spectrum. <coughs> so, if we one of the problems with the 2.4 gigahertz band is we have three non-overlapping channels. That's a problem for us. I put one on channel one here, six, 11. What do I put behind me? What do I put in front of me? What do I put the floor below, the floor above? I run out of channels really quickly. That causes co-channel interference. It causes performance problems. 
So on the 5 gig band, do we want to create the same situation? If we go to 160 megahertz channels, we've now limited all that spectrum to two channels. If we go to 80 meg channels, we've got five. Actually, with the new channels now in the UK that have just opened up, we can actually get, <coughs> we can actually get another one, so we could get six. But it's still not that many channels. All that benefit we've got, we've lost. The other thing is, every time, I think Keith also mentioned this, every time we double the channel width, we double our noise. We're now listening, uh, instead of over a 20 meg channel, a 40 meg, so our noise is going to increase. So we need more signal to get a good signal-to-noise ratio. What do we do with Wi-Fi before we talk? We listen. If I'm listening on a 80 meg channel, that's four 20 meg channels that have to be quiet before I can use it. <coughs> so I've now got to, I've got to get more of that spectrum three before I can transmit. This is an um, e easy test. Anyone can do it in a lab. Um, if you set up a 40 megahertz AP, let's say you pick channel 38, which is 36 and 40 bonded together, and you do a throughput test on it, okay? And you, uh, you have two, two clients, both connected to the same AP, both pulling data down from the AP as fast as they can, FTP pull. And you... And you, and you work out the aggregate throughput, the throughput they both got, um, and you call that. If you then set another AP up, one on channel 36, one on 40, and you connect a client to each AP, but just 20 meg channels, so you're still using the same spectrum you were, and do the same task, the aggregate from using two 20s will be more than the 140. Because although they can transmit a higher data rate with 40, it's still one at a time, isn't it? But now they can go two at a time, but they're sending less data, and they're not contending with each other. In, a higher di di in, in sort of high-density environments, you are better with smaller channels. In really high-density environments, if they could give me 10 meg channels, I would take them. Because you want to make sure you're s separating out your clients. Let's just have a quick think about then channel capacity then. <coughs> This is a chart taken from Aruba's high density um, design guides, um, but you can, it just shows you that in a 20 meg channel, if we're taking the, the pink um, one shows us um, five gigahertz, two spatial streams, and the aggregate throughput with 10 clients is, was getting about 60 megabits per second. Okay? When we went to 20 clients on the same AP, it was about 60 megabits, it was about 60 megabits per second. As Keith was saying, up to about 25. You may even get a bit of an improvement, but it, it stays about the same. Once you go above that, you'll notice once we get to 30, 40, 50, the more clients you connect, the aggregate throughput's actually going to go down per AP. So what does that mean? That means we want to have less clients per AP, what we're really talking about are not per AP, per channel. Because two APs on the same channel. So the key to what we want to do is try and get frequency reuse. We need to be using, as, we need to get our clients split up onto as many channels as possible. Here's them um, just uh, looking at the per client throughput here now across um, w w as the client count goes up on an AP. So this is, even if we look at our very, our sort of two spatial stream five, 5G one, we can see the, that once you get past sort of 50 clients connected, even if all those 50 are two spatial stream 5G capable, every client's getting less than one mag each anyway. So as more clients you get into a channel, but once you get above sort of 40, 50, they're starting to get down to one mag anyway. And no one's going to achieve anything more than that. But in the real world, all my clients are not two or three spatial stream capable. We have mixed clients, don't we? We have two spatial stream, three spatial stream devices, single spatial stream firms, and we have legacy devices as well that can only do A, B, and G. And they're all going to connect at the same time. So I think for a long time, Wi-Fi has all been, well, you need the latest AC, four spatial stream AP, and you need the latest client. And if you've got, you know, I've got a MacBook Pro, it's got a three spatial stream, 802.11 AC, chip in it, I am going to go fast. 
But it's like saying, um, I'm going to buy a Ferrari. And I've got a Ferrari sports car, supercar. The problem with a Ferrari supercar is if you're driving it in rush hour, how fast can you go? You can go rush hour speed, can you? Same speed as anyone else. You can't go any faster just because you've got a Ferrari when you're sharing the road with other users. So you might be able to send your packets fast, but when there's that G device that they're going, sending its data like that, so you're a G device, okay, I, I'm, my, I, I'm going to be the Ferrari this time. Um, and um, I'm both associated with the same AP, and we're, sending the same, we're both pulling the same file from the AP. Okay, sends the packet to you. I send one. Sends one to you. I send one. Sends one to you. I send one. You're slowing me down. Although I'm sending my packets really fast, I keep having to wait for your slow transmissions. Um, and this is the key. So we've got another graph here um, showing per client throughput. So it's some more statistics from um, the, the high density design guide. What I like about this one is, so the, the, the red line is showing a free spatial stream um, laptop, okay? And when you had about 10 people, they're getting about 20 megabits each, okay? Um, and it says about sort of 200 megabits sort of for throughput capacity in that AP. In, in that AP. Um, but when we, and you can see how, how it drops off. But if we look at these dotted lines, these are mixed. We don't have all 100% free spatial stream devices, do we? So if we took, say, this line here, which says we've got 10% free spatial stream, 60% two spatial stream, and 30% one, you can see the data rate drops off very, very fast to this sort of first dotted line. And again, once we go above sort of 25, we're down to sort of two meg, three meg. That's just the reality of what Wi-Fi is like. So how do we design for capacity, given everything we've said? I want to just go over uh, one of the last things we'll talk about. Um, a, uh, this was a um, customer of mine who came to me and said they were having a, um, it was a conference center, and you can see this is a building plan for the conference center. There was some tiered seating, and there was going to be 800 people at the conference. And they'd never had a big conference there before. Um, so they knew they didn't have the capacity. They currently had one AP. Um, serving the entire room. But we're going to have 800 people, and they'd come up with this statistic that it, they, each person would have an average of 1.5 devices so per person. So it'd be probably about 1,200 devices that they wanted to design for. So we have a look at what one AP does in terms of coverage. It covers the room quite nicely. So it's been just designed for coverage, and it had one AP in it. But now they, they recognise they needed to go to capacity. They didn't come to me straight away. They first of all sent their plans off and the requirements off to their Wi-Fi. This was part of a US com company. They sent them off to some guys in the US, their Wi-Fi experts in the US, to come up with a design. This is what they got back. <laughs> and this is what they gave me. They were giving me it to check with me whether it might work well. So they've got back with the customer solution being 26 access points. Now, because it was a high-density environment, they've gone for, I don't know if any of you have seen it, the Cisco high-density antenna, which is like a big patch antenna. And it's like 30 degrees, I think it is, in one direction. You put it up on the ceiling and you point it straight down. And they've literally gone for a grid of them. It's almost how many can you get in the room. Um, it might look like an art installation if you looked up at it, but... Um, <laughs> This is what they've gone, gone for. And so all of these were these high-gain Cisco and, um, and antennas. And they were going to um, put them all up there. Now, one of the problems is, is we, we say 30 degrees, is that, and they're using directional antennas because the one omni goes everywhere. This was a really high ceiling. Do you know one of these will cover the whole room as well? Um, if you're going to install it that high. So th th their answer was to just go for these 26 APs. Um, and the uh, first thing I said to them is I went, well, the first thing I said, well, that won't work. 
Um, when because they, they shared me and they said, oh, we're having a bit of a problem because we can't get these, they couldn't actually get the Cisco antennas in time for the conference. They had them on, so that's the only reason they came to me. Could you look at this design, tell us maybe what we could do? And I just said, well, if you install that design, it won't work anyway. So one thing I, so the, the thing is more AP zone mean more capacity. That's the first thing to uh, come over with. Um, so they had an awful lot of APs, but we needed to reduce the number. Um, so it, that, I won't go through everything I did because we're, we're running out of time here, but we, we basically reduced that massively down to just a, a very small number. Basically, we used all the five gig channels we could, which was 15, because they wanted maximum capacity possible, and we ended up with 15 APs and, and then um, put proper load balancing and AP radio counts on there so people spread out nicely across it. But don't think putting more APs mean more capacity. Very last thing, just to mention, is if you're going to do a Wi-Fi design, please do spectrum analysis. You could do all the rest of the stuff right. Information, you get all the requirements, you design it right, you come up, you visit the site, you take the measurements, you get the capacity right, but if there's an interference source there, the Wi-Fi won't work. And so many reasons why I said I go in there and it's been bad design. Sometimes that's bad design means when they were designing it, they never did any spectrum analysis and realized that there's things interfering with the wireless network. Do spectrum analysis. So quick summarize, and I've got just one more thing I'd quite like to just finish on. But great Wi-Fi starts with great design. You want to do detailed customer capture, specify realistic requirements, um, proper AP placement, um, spectrum analysis, and always do a validation. Um, just before we finish, I just want to quickly mention to you um, an organization I've been involved in. It's quite a new organization, and not many people know about it, which is why I wanted to mention it. We've recently, relatively recently, set up something called the Wireless and Association. Um, it is a um, professional industry um, body. It, we're a non-profit organization for people like you guys here. One thing that we realized in the industry, there's lots of organizations in our industry which have voices in our industry. You've got the IEEE who create standards. You've got the Wi-Fi Alliance who certify products. You've got vendors who make products. Uh, you've got CWP who certify individuals. But who represents the people who are the Wi-Fi assessors, the designers, the implementers? We don't seem to have any sort of professional association. Um, that's what we've tried to set up with the Wireless and Association. Um, just go and check out our website. It's wlnassociation.org. Um, if you want any more information, I have a few flyers and stuff about it as well, so just come and see me afterwards. But I'd love it if you wanted to sign up and join us um, again. But apart from that, thank you very much. <laughs>